Hi, I'm Rob Cos and welcome to my shop. If you build cabinets that, with doors, you have to be able to install those hinges. This is an inset door and I'm gonna show you how I install the traditional butt hinge. Stay with us. I'm Rob Cosman and welcome to my shop. We make it our job to help you take your woodworking to the next level. If you're new to our channel, be sure to subscribe, turn on that notification bell, and don't forget to turn on the notification on your mobile device so you'll know every time we release a new video. Good? All right, back to the bench. So we built this cabinet to hold all of my personal protective equipment, meaning masks and goggles and whatever. We did that in a previous video, I'll leave you a link. In another video, we actually made this frame and panel door. It has traditional mortise and tenon joints, has a flat solid wood panel on the inside. We'll leave a link to that. And I went in and I showed you how to fit it to the opening and it's an extremely tight fit. I'll do the fine tuning after we've installed the hinges. So you can go and check that video out as well. We'll leave a description on that one. Now, when it comes to hinges, the better your work, the better you want your hinges to be. You don't want any slop in them. That's all going to affect how it interacts with the cabinet. And I want this to be as precise as I can. These, uh, it, and good hinges don't come cheap, so be prepared. A little bit of sticker shock when you buy them. These are the ones that I'm going to use. It's a butt hinge. It's going to fit on that door. So all that you'll see is that barrel on the back. And hopefully we'll get it to fit it perfectly. But I expect, fully intend, to come after we've installed the hinges to come in and have to do a little bit of trimming to get that to fit the opening. But at least I'm starting with something that fits tight top to bottom, tight side to side. And that's where I want to begin. But traditional furniture always used, or high quality traditional furniture almost always used a butt hinge. Joining the door or with the two surfaces, the butting surfaces, the edge of the cabinet and the edge of the door. What's really nice about these is that they're designed to be mortised. So in other words, we're going to cut a rectangular recess on both surfaces. So when that goes in there and closes, we have very little gap. Now, they're different. You can get them at all different sizes as well. There's little tiny ones. You can get them much bigger. But here's a comparison between the run-of-the-mill stuff you're going to get at the hardware store versus the specialty. So I can sit there and wiggle these. That's going to show up in slop in the fit of your door whereas these ones can't, no wiggle. If you close these, you're also gonna notice how much of a gap you're dealing with when the two leaves, that's what these are called, are parallel to each other. As opposed to this one, when we get these two leaves parallel to each other, a much smaller gap. I sometimes think these are actually designed so that they don't even have to mortise them. They can just slap them right on the surface, which is not what you would look and find in quality work. You want the ones that are extruded, not stamped. Typically they're made out of brass, but they can come in other metals as well. Um, they can get them polished or brushed. This is brushed, this is polished. That's personal preference. But, uh, and they're held on by three screws designed to be countersunk, and you're gonna want brass screws there as well. These just give you a much finer job. However, there's no adjustment after you've installed them. Don't expect to find these at your local hardware. You usually have to order them specialty. These, like I said, run of the mill and not the kind of work that we're dealing with today. Now we need to talk about the size of the hinge and how many. So typically on a furniture door, you're only gonna need two hinges, obviously bottom and top. If this was a lot bigger, let's say it was three feet tall, I would probably add in a third hinge that would go in the middle. Now, in terms of the size across the width, so this has two leaves and a barrel down the middle, and of course there's a pin in that barrel. When I mortise this on the edge of the door, I'm going to put that entire leaf, so from the outside edge to right in there, not including the barrel, that is going to be mortised into the side. So that's going to sit just like that. Now, this is a little on the small side. If I'd have had my choice, I probably would have had this leaf come over to about there, leaving at least about an eighth of an inch on the back side. What you don't want to do is put a hinge on there like the so, where you end up with a 32nd of an inch of wood out here beyond the edge. That's just too fragile. That would be too big. As far as the length, these could have been a little bit longer. This will do. 
I didn't have the options that I wanted, but had I had time, more time to pick out what I wanted, I would have made these probably half an inch longer and maybe an eighth of an inch wider. Okay, now we're gonna talk about where we're gonna position the hinge. And I, I, you know, there's lots of rules that you can follow, but I like, to, I like to just decide based on how it looks. And typically what we would do is we would put that hinge sitting right on top of the rail and this one right at the bottom of the rail. But let's actually okay, put it, let's go to work on this. I still have to go in and finish these so I can get rid of that mark easy enough. Now put this in the vise so it's at a good working height. I wrote on the inside it should be out here. Okay, so this hinge is going to sit like that. And and doesn't matter whether you use the one that's attached down here, whether you use the one that's attached up there, but I'm going to use the one that's has a nice end to the to the leaf right there. Okay, I'm going to set my marking gauge for okay, that's the thickness of this leaf put over here too if you want it now I need to know how far to go end to end so we'll put this on here and I don't want to make too heavy of a mark because I want the flat of the marking knife to be up against here, but it's going to put the bevel on the outside. We really want the bevel on the inside. So I'm just gonna do a very, very light mark that I'll go in later and correct with a chisel. Okay, so I'm gonna take my marking gauge, the bevel's cutting on the inside, which is gonna be where the waist is. And I'm going to run that, referencing off of the front. I'm gonna run that, this is pine, so it cuts really easily. Nice thing about a round wheel marking gauge is you can just roll it that last little bit to get it where you want. Nice deep cut. Now, these should be nice and square across the end. And if they weren't, I wouldn't hesitate to take them over to the uh, disc sander and clean them up. In fact, as I inspect these, they're not as square as they should be. When I put that square on there, this end is lower than this end. So I'm going to go over to the, to the disc sander and I'm going to trim those up. That's going to make it a lot easier for me to fit them if they're square to start with. I made a little tray to hold these. Now, I've just got it clamped onto my miter gauge. And if you don't have a uh, disc sander, remember this stuff is really soft. You could do it with a file. It's just gonna take you a little more time. It's gonna be a little more careful. File and check, file and check. And the luxury of having this, I'm just gonna make sure that this miter gauge with that little tray is square to the face of the disc sander. I made that little cutout just to make it a little bit easier to get my fingers in there. Now I don't want to take off much, so I'm just going to reference one side over here somewhere. And even though it's going to scratch it up, it doesn't matter. This is all going to be hidden. Still haven't made contact over here yet.
just about done. Okay, now flip that around. Now there's a little bit of a burr from that. It's not a big deal, but I'm just gonna take that off the file. But I also noticed that when they drilled these holes, they left the burr in the bottom side. So while I've got the file in my hand, I'm just gonna smooth that out so it'll sit better in the bottom of the mortise. Now there's a bit of a burr left on there and it's not a big deal, but I also noticed that there's a burr where they drilled the hole and I want that to sit on softwood. It probably wouldn't matter on hardwood. It might. I want that to sit nice and flat when it's set down into the mortise. So I'm just going to take a second to remove that burr. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to that original mark, and because they're square, instead of using that, which is hard to hold on to, I can come in here with my little square. I've got, I have the back side of this knife up against the square, so that's gonna keep the bevel on the inside where I want it. Now we'll put this in place. No, it didn't take much off because that's in the same spot it was. Rather than trying to stop at this line, it's easier to get stop close and then come in and go the other way. Get that last little bit. Okay, so we've got to remove that. You can do it with a chisel, you can do it with a butt mortise plane, or you can do it with a small router plane. So I'm going to use a small router plane. However, I need a little more surface area. When I'm done, all I've got is that little strip right there. So what I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna raise this up a little bit and I'm gonna go in and clamp a couple pieces on here so that that'll provide me with a little more support. But I also have to come in and set the blade to the thickness of the hinge. However, rather than try to do that with one pass, which on softwood might not be so bad, on hardwood it's gonna require a lot of extra effort and the more effort you put into using a tool like this, the more likely you are to not have the kind of control you want. So I'm going to set that for a little bit less than the actual thickness. It'll allow me to get out most of the material. It's got to go down a little bit further. It'll allow me to get out most of the material and I can come back and just do a one final little cleanup pass. Hey, if you like this video, we have more. Our monthly newsletter has subscriber-only content, discounts monthly on tools, and anything we bring out that's new, subscribers get first crack at it. Click on the link below. Let's get back to work. Bring it up. Okay, now I can go in there. Don't know which way the grain's running, but I can find that out quick enough. Okay, so that's the direction I want to go. Now you want to make sure that those ends, in fact, 
on hardwood, you really have to do this. I can get away without doing it on softwood, but I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway. And that is I'm going to make those end cuts well-defined so that when my blade from my router plane comes over and I'm having to push, I've got a nice solid wall to stop against instead of this situation where it could easily continue to go. So I'll go in here. The first thing I'm going to do is come about, uh, oh, almost an eighth of an inch away. Cut a little relief. And then as I start chopping down, now I have somewhere for the chisel to push the waste instead of shoving it beyond my gauge line. If I were to simply come on here and push that chisel down in there, the amount of pressure on this side pushing on the bevel may very well push this chisel this way and breach that nice sharp line I want. But if you get a little bit of a relief area first, that prevents that from happening. This one, I don't have any choice. I've got to go against the grain, but another reason to make several light passes instead of trying to take it all out at once. Okay, now I've got somewhat of a protective wall on three sides, which will just help me from, or hopefully prevent me from accidentally sliding, slipping beyond if I'm having to push a little harder than what I'm, what allow, what control I have. I'm just going to go in there and define this corner. Okay, so now we'll, yeah, it would be smart to go and do all of these so I'm not having to change my my uh, setting four different times, but for the sake of showing you how to do this, I'm just going to focus on getting this one done on film.
Okay, let's try that. Okay, nice fit. Now when it comes to actually installing the screws, I'll come in. Remember this is pine, so it's soft enough that you really probably don't need a pilot hole. I'm going to take my awl. Got lots of support back here. So I'm going to take my awl and I'm going to purposely put that to the inside of center. So that when that screw goes in, you don't want it to get, if you're too far off, then the head won't sit down in that nice countersink area. But this will just do a little bit of a job in pulling the hinge tight so that we keep that nice tight line along there. Okay, let's do this second one with just a chisel. I realize not everybody's going to have a router plane. Uh, I've already gone in and I've outlined it the same way we did, use the marking gauge on the back, use the chisel on both ends. Now, I'm gonna use my other, uh, another marking gauge and this one has a nice large diameter cutter. And I'm just going to set it off of this one. So what I'll do is come over here, set the gauge on there like so, drop that down until the cutter references on that bottom. And now I can come in here and just give myself a line. I can actually use this almost in place of a chisel, particularly on softwood like pine. But to make it a little bit easier, we'll come in with the chisel and pair straight across. Now, if you're not, if you're not uh, confident in your skills, you could come in and you could clamp piece of wood like that, line it up, and then you could use that as a reference to pair across. Now this is, again, this is northern white pine. It's really soft, not hard to do. But rather than just go right on the baseline right away and have to remove all that material, if you try doing it in a couple of steps, then it's going to be easier because you don't have to push as hard and you have a lot more control. And you don't want to slam into that backside and accidentally breach that gauge mark. Just a little bit of side to side wiggle to make it a little easier to pass through. And another tip would be to use a narrow chisel and then you're not moving as much wood and that'll certainly increase your Um, accuracy. Now, I didn't come in here and do what I did before, so make a relief cut, a second one, and then in the gauge line, no pressure on the bevel, and I can go down the thickness. Make sure there's no debris left in those corners. One last check with the gauge. I don't see any marks. We'll try. It's just like the top one. Now, you might not have to do this with pine, but definitely with hardwood, and that is drill a pilot hole. In fact, if you're using brass screws on, a, uh, on hardwood, you're actually best to go in, drill a pilot hole, 
get a steel screw, same size, put it all the way in, let it cut the threads, and then come in with your brass screw. Brass screws do not tend to be very strong, and the last thing you want is to break the screw off. So I'm just going to go in there and using the hole that I made with the awl. This is the top. I identified those two hinges simply because um, I wasn't sure they were exactly the same size after squaring up the ends. Now, that does not sit as flush as I would like, so I may have to come in and countersink those hinges a little more. I really don't want to go down to a smaller screw. There's the cabinet as it will be on the wall. This is the door, fits in like this. So now what I can do, all I, all I really need to do is just mark tops and bottoms of each inch because the marking gauge has already been set, this one, to the uh, how far in it's gonna go. And then that'll make sure that those, that uh, surface is flush with the edge of the, of the case. Because I've squared these off, I just need a mark, and then I can do the rest with a square and the uh, square and the striking knife. Now, don't want to be in too far. Remember, we always want the bevel on the inside. Another reason to place your hinges a little bit in from the ends is to be able to come in here with the right tool and do the job. If you're right up tight, it'd be pretty hard. Now, grain direction appears to be this way, so start on the outside. I always like to get that outside edge defined first, and I like to cut it like this with a cutter on an angle so that it's not tending to pull fibers off this way, the pressure is going on the inside, if that makes sense. Oh, 
always want to make sure you've got the uh, base of the tool well supported by the wood around it. When you're out here like this, the cutter's pulling it down this way, so you really have to counteract that with lots of downward pressure, in this case with my left hand. It'll clean up with chisel. Make sure. Okay, I can tell it's nice and flush. Perfect. Okay, same process for this one. second and start those okay I'll put those other four in now we're gonna have to take some off the bottom And I don't think that's going to close just yet, so. But we've got them in place. So I think what I'll do now is take them off the door and go in and take, if I, as long as I take a continuous pass, top and bottom, I probably need four or five passes. This is going to take some time because I can take it off, I can take more off, but I can't put it back on, so that has to be done carefully. Okay, okay I'm gonna take the same number of passes off top and bottom. So I'm gonna come to this side first, just because I wanna plane this piece in this direction. And what I'm gonna do is just plane in from the end, a few passes, so as not to allow that to break out when I come across. Before I put it back on, I'm going to go in and cut or plane a bevel. So this is the outside. This is the side that closes against here. I'm going to plane a bevel on this that'll just give me a little bit of clearance. So I'm going to draw some lines across there. So we know we're not, I don't want to touch anything here. I just want to remove or lower that side. So using the plane, by keeping this side flush to here, that means that part of the sole prevents me from taking any material. You can see where the pencil mark is still there. Take one to clean it up, and it's going to take two. Okay, now we'll put that back on. Now, since I'm probably going to have to take this door off multiple times in order to get exactly what I want, you don't want to be cross-threading that hole. So when you put your screw back in, you can turn it backwards until you feel it 
it'll drop in and match up those threads that were originally cut the first time you put it in. Now I still don't know if we're going to bind on those. You can see how far out they stick, so I'm going to have to go in for sure and countersink that brass hinge a little bit more. Oh, I better put a piece of tape on here because I don't have a handle on it yet. Okay, so if we look up here, that door will actually close, but down here it's bumping, and that coincides with this. I want to make sure, too, that we're not... I'm pretty sure those screw heads are not touching. Although, there's a slight chance that could be the issue. So I'm going to take them off. I'm going to go back in. I'm going to countersink those brass hinges so that that screw will sit flush. And that might cure that. We'll try it. If not, I've got to go in and I've got to drop the mortise on either one of these just enough to make up that little bit of difference. And if we do, I think that'll give us exactly what we're looking for. So I took all those out and countersunk them. And it didn't give me what I wanted, so that wasn't the issue. So what I'm going to do now is go in, take the door off. I'm going to set that hinge in just the amount. It's the difference between these two, which isn't more than about the thickness of a couple pieces of tape. Here we go. Using my marking gauge on this, so I'm going to go in and make sure that that is the depth that it was. Then I'll come in here and put a couple pieces of masking tape on there. Set the uh, gauge on top of the masking tape. Probably should have cut that other way a little bit. Now we take that off, and that should give us just a little bit. actually went in and we used the feeler gauge and we determined that the gap at the top was 26 thou and the gap at the bottom was 30. Well, that's what this masking tape is, four thousandths of an inch. So we did one more and now let's see what happens. Okay, so my gap looks the exact same top to bottom across the top. So all we have to do now is just go in and do a little bit of adjustment on this. It's a little bit snug at the bottom. I want to make sure it's not, it's clear of the bottom so it's out here on the edge, which is good. Now we cut a bevel on the inside, so that should make it easier to fit. I'm going to put another piece on the top so we have something to hold on to. This door is going to get a just a half round hole in there so it matches everything else. Now I'm going to use my low angle block. Actually, that needs it. We need a little more off on the inside, so I'm going to work on that bevel. in here as well.
So somewhere in between here and here. So I'll start my plane right there. Take a pass. Now the final pass will go from end to end so we can get rid of that little transition mark. Okay, so that's closing too tight and we, need, we want to introduce that same gap over here. But now that it's pretty much same top to bottom, we can make a complete pass. I would prefer to take the door off and actually do this in the, in the vise. However, then you got to put it back on every time. So I'm going to try to do it. Okay, gap is the same, uniform, still needs to be maybe two more passes, possibly three. But we're, we've got the same reveal all the way, so that just makes it easier, just have to have a continual pass. Maybe one more. That's it. Okay, take the weight off. I hear some creaking. So there's our reveal, which is pretty much the same all the way around. Now I still got to go in and just do a little bit of a finish work on there and get rid of some of those marks and fingerprints. But there's our hinges. Now, I also noticed, and I forgot when I, when I polished or ground those hinges, that that part ended up coming not, uh, that's somewhat rough. So I could go in and just polish those ends in case it bothers somebody. Well, there you go. Imagine doing a whole kitchen like that. No. If you like my work and enjoy my style of teaching, click on any one of these videos and help take your woodworking to the next level. I've always said, better tools make the job so much easier. If you click on the link below, the chisel and plane icon, it'll take you to our site and introduce you to all the tools that we actually manufacture right here in our shop. It'll also give you information on our online and in-person workshops.